good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll invite my panel to join me, and I will let them tell you all about themselves fairly shortly. Um, now, we're here today at a RegTech conference, so I'm going to encourage you to have your phones out and to actually respond to the polling questions that's available on the app on the, uh, the PSD2 session that's in the app, and uh, hopefully we can have some audience participation later on in our discussion. We are here to talk about PSD2 and open banking uh, with the catchily titled Final Push for this year's deadline. For those who may not be aware, there's a, there's a very important deadline of the 14th of September that's looming over the heads of, well, particularly Tobias from the Danish FSA and um, Andy from HSBC. And I think Justin is just, you know, happy watching what's happening. <laughs> um, for those who may not be familiar, PSC2 is the Payment Services Directive. Two is obviously it's the revised, the revision. And um, it requires that as of the 14th of September this year, primarily banks, account, pay, account servicing payment service providers, have to give access to regulated actors account information service providers and payment initiation service providers to the data available on that payment account. And they can do that either via a dedicated API interface or by adapting their online customer banking interface. Now, it's been debated for a number of years, has PSD2. It uh, came into effect in January 2018, and we now have this looming deadline of September the 14th, 2019. The aim of PSD2 is to have secure payments, innovation and competition. And we will obviously learn from our panellists as we go forward how these aims are actually going to be achieved. But uh, before we continue, let's take a few minutes and my panellists will actually introduce themselves to you. Tobias. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Tobias Teigesen. I'm a director at the Danish FSA. I'm responsible for, among other things, uh, payment services and uh, fintech. So the, the implementation of the PSD2 and the licensing under the PSD2 is in my division. And I also have responsibility for the, um, um, for the fintech or the innovation hub of the Danish FSA. My uh, sad love story with the PSD2 started already in 2012, where I joined the Danish Bankers Association, so I've also seen this directive from the other side of, of the table. And it perhaps says something about the, the speed of uh, regulation within the EU that we're here seven years later and we're still debating more or less the same issues as, as we did in 2012. Thank you. Andy. Uh, hi, Andy, HSBC. So I'm the Programme Manager for UK and Europe uh, for PSD and Open Banking. So at the moment, one of the core concerns is the exemption processes uh, and dealing with interpretations from multiple different regulators across Europe uh, and how those interpretations differ. I'm sure we can get into that discussion later. Um, I'm with HSBC for about two years now, primarily on PS2 and open banking. So enjoying it thoroughly. And Justin. Uh, my name is Justin Fitzpatrick. I'm co-founder and CEO of Doodle. We're a predictive company intelligence platform. And what we do is extract, clean, and link together authoritative data to tell the story behind a business and the people behind it. Um, so we're working a lot with both fintechs and incumbents on their end-to-end -end, uh, customer journey around SME and commercial lines of business and um, providing a process that's not only robust from a regulatory perspective but also uh, lends itself to a much better customer experience. Thank you. So we're in a space where I think everybody's agreed on the perceived benefits of PSD2. It should have provide for innovation, provide for competition, and more, most importantly, provide one for secure payments and two for really good customer outcomes. That's the intention behind the support for these new AIS and PIS services. But obviously there are some challenges that we're facing right now, and each of my panelists will uh, give you their view on some of those challenges. Uh, so Tobias, what, what do you think uh, right now is the hot topic in Denmark for PSD2? Well, I think, firstly, as you say, the hot topic is not whether PSD2 is actually a good thing. I think when we started back in 2012, a lot of banks were quite hesitant and they were saying, 
why should we let these uh, these odd companies access our data and, and make payments through our infrastructure? We don't have that debate anymore. I think the banks are all signed on to the, this. We, this is going to happen. We want to do it uh, the right way. On the other hand, the other discussion we're not having is basically what can we use open banking for? What will it actually deliver in the final instance? So the hot topic is basically one of a, a compliance exercise for the banks. They have to, to deliver these APIs that third parties access. And, and the worry is really uh, how to make, make these two uh, parties meet. They, there's a, a big difference, I think, in mentality between banks and, and these third party providers, with the, sort of the, the focus on the compliance bit, on the security of payments, and then on, on from the fintechs, there's a lot of focus on the customer journey that you have to do it, be able to do it on a mobile phone, uh, etc. And, and, and the banks really want to make sure that their customers are, know what they're doing and the fintechs just want, why do you ask your customers whether they want to access uh, my services because they're doing it so you don't have to ask them also. So I think that's sort of the big topic that we have at the moment, making two parties, both who want to make this work but, but who have a very different mentality set making them meet and making this market work for, uh, and with a very tight deadline of the uh, 14th of September. Thank you. So that's some of the challenges that are seen by the regulator. Andy, obviously HSBC has got to implement what's required under PSD2 and the RTS and you can obviously talk hopefully maybe to both sides because HSBC is a bank and has to provide the access but HSBC also provides uh, a, an AIS service. Correct, we're a bank and a DPP, and I think I'm going to add in a, a third party, which is the regulator. So this is not a two-party ecosystem, it's a three-party ecosystem. And the reason is TPPs have to be regulated now. So suddenly it isn't just a case of the reg regulator can leave this ecosystem alone. Regulators maybe are straying into territory in the path they weren't used to, which is they have to take an active engagement in the eco ecosystem. And, we see from the FCA in the UK, um, I think there's around 120 different TPPs in the, in the funnel of uh, trying to get through FCA registration. Uh, and some are taking longer than others, but it just shows you that the FCA are having to actually work quite hard as well to get this ecosystem off the ground. In, in terms of the implementation, I mean, the challenge itself and time is the biggest one. Uh, anyone that doesn't say that, uh, I think, is deluding themselves just the complexity of delivering APIs across, in our instance, different business lines, uh, different countries, different jurisdictions, uh, using different standards, which are one of the really, really key things for us. So I don't know how much people are aware, but in the UK, you have something called the OBIE standard for APIs. Uh, France, you have something called STET, and then a pan-European standard called Berlin Group. And you have sometimes the same country, multiple banks using different standards which doesn't help the TPP uh, and doesn't help banks when they implement it, probably doesn't help the regulator either. But that is the situation we're in. Um, strangely enough, the UK is probably in a better position, I think, because of the CMA order um, and the CMA nine banks, the top nine banks, using the same standard, because they have to do the OBA standard. It actually creates almost a, a central ecosystem that the rest of the industry can build off. Um, but yeah, and from the TPP side for HSBC, um, we are also waiting for the 14th of September. So oddly enough, you know, part of us is waiting on the other part. Um, an odd situation to be in. And I think until that time hits, you're not going to see a large growth in TPP numbers, especially across the rest of Europe. Thank you. So you've mentioned, obviously, the challenge of time. We've heard the challenges for the regulator. So Justin, take us through your thoughts as to Given the discussion we've had so far, what do you think are the must-haves if we look sort of slightly forward in time? Yeah, so I think um, you know Andy did a good job of um, articulating a lot of the challenges, and one of the primary ones is uh, degree of consistency, standardization, and interoperability um, across uh, different you know API standards. I, I was in the U.S. two weeks ago at a, a regulatory conference there, and. Um, you know, while you know, I can imagine the immense pressure that you know Andy and his his colleagues are under, and and uh, you know the the pressure that the regulators are, are putting on participants in the market, um, it's worth sort of noting how you know how much of a difference there is in Europe versus the United States, because 
Um, you know, here we're talking about, you know, kind of converging around different API standards. In the U.S., you have overlapping jurisdiction of regula and regulators who are trying to agree on definitions of, you know, market terms, right? And so, and, and just, uh, you know, opening up data, you know, of any sort is, a, is, a, is new territory for them. So I think, you know, as we go forward, if we want the ecosystem to mature, um, to its potential, we really need to be looking at how we bring those standards in line with one another and apply the regulation in a consistent way so that all the participants in the ecosystem kind of know what to expect. So you're almost talking there um, or touching upon what would be maybe a global standard for, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, an access API or something like that seems to be something that you're touching on. You've mentioned it as well, Andy. I mean, from my perspective of OBIB, OBIE, we actually produce the standard that Andy and his colleagues are having to implement. Um, and we can very much see the benefits of standardization. And I know that there are conversations happening across the standards bodies. There are conversations happening at EU level about having a single SEPA API standard. Um, what would be your thoughts on that? Tobias, do you think that, I mean, I, I understand we've got immediate challenges, but slightly longer term. Well, I think, I mean, a, a common standard would really make sense, but uh, I think a lot of people look to us as the regulators to, to sort of uh, point the way, and, and that's not a role that sits very well with us. I mean, we normally leave it to the market to sort, sort out which solutions do you want to go with, and, and then we, we don't, as the FCA has perhaps, over here in, in the UK, has perhaps a, a slightly more activist role, but we sort of stick to the rules and then we, uh, we let the market sort it out. So it's actually quite a big diff difficulty for us to be in the middle of this discussion about which standard to adopt. So, so I think, you know, the regulators would do well to get ahead of this issue because, in, you know, in my world, um, we've seen the consequences of, of not getting ahead of it in a, in a slightly different context. So, um, you know, now there's a move towards unique identifiers for businesses and the standard that people are converging towards are uh, legal entity identifiers, LEIs. Now that's happened after, you know, decades of a single provider basically monopolizing a uh, standard around identifiers for businesses. And so, you know, it gets really problematic you know, if you just sort of let the market sort it out, well, the market will eventually sort it out, um, but you're probably going to create a monopoly in the process for something that ultimately should be a utility. Um, and so for something like, uh, you know, a, a standard around APIs, you know, we know the benefits of standardization in other parts of our lives. I don't see why this is an area that we can't, um, you know, create a standard as well on, around as well. Andy, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think if we take a step back, the, the regulation is all about the customer in theory. Um, does the customer know if it's standardised or not? No. Do they care? No. Um, therefore, what works best for the industry should work best for the customer. Uh, and I think this is where the, the EBA maybe didn't quite think far enough ahead many years ago. Um, and maybe they didn't realise how different the implementations would be across countries. Because I think where we're going to end up on the 14th of September is TPPs will struggle to operate across countries in Europe um, because of the different interpretations. Even on the same standard, the different interpretations are quite stark. Uh, and I think it will take it will get sorted out. It will take years, uh, and the software will be the customer. So I think in, in maybe the bigger jurisdictions, the customers will be able to use API services. In the UK, API services are already up and running, thanks to the CMA order, uh, and we're seeing good use of it. But I think maybe in some of the smaller European jurisdictions, customers will suffer. Uh, and you know, we, we've seen uh, there aren't TPPs in some markets. So you know, take something like Malta, for example. There are no, I think, registered Maltese TPPs. Um, you know, uh, when are we going to see those? Probably not for years, because a TPP will start with maybe UK, maybe Ireland, maybe France, maybe Germany. You know, and they'll expand outwards. Uh, Malta, unfortunately, probably isn't anyone's top ten. But it's the customer that will suffer. Thank you. And you actually brought across a really important point that, yes, you can have a single standard, but it's the implementation of that standard that is actually very, very important in that if you are consuming API data, 
I would assume you probably want to know that, you know, box A will have this information and box B will have this information and box C will have the following information. And I think that's a challenge I know that we've seen in the UK and open banking has sought to address. I think it's a challenge that probably is live for other regulators and jurisdictions. Is this something that you've, you've thought about, Tobias? Well, we thought about it, but we don't really have the solution or, or actually the mandate to do anything. I mean, our problem is basically we cannot dictate what the bank should do, and we probably wouldn't feel comfortable in doing it either. I mean, you have a, a, another setup over here because you had a specific powers uh, bestowed upon you, which is a problem for us, basically, and we wouldn't go and tell the banks you have to make the API thus and thus. It's, uh, it, does, it doesn't really sit well with us. I mean, I think the you know, the... the dangers of that are, are clear, right? There's a very obvious collective action problem there where, you know, unless there's a, a forcing factor around something like this, I think there's very little incentive for um, the banks or whoever the participants in the market are to get together and agree a, a common set of standards. And so, you know, if you have a bunch of people sort of standing around going, it's not my problem, then it's probably going to not really get fixed. I agree, but I think and the UK is slightly different. I mean, funding always comes into it as well. Who's going to fund this central body in the UK because of the CME order? Funding was, was kind of agreed it was the big banks. Uh, I think other big banks across Europe pretty, you know, would say, well, we're not going to volunteer this funding. So it, it does then, you know, the practical problems almost hinder the, the maybe the pragmatic conversation which should take place. Um, but I think and maybe as well, we think going forward, uh, there's already conversations around well, why are we stopping at payments? Accounts. You know, why have we not got APIs for mortgages, loans, savings? I saw you have savings, but insurance products, pensions. Um, you know, and and you know, we provide you know expertise to other HSBC countries. Hong Kong regulator, Australian regulator, Canadian regulator. They are taking us as a base, but they are already starting to look further ahead. Uh, so if we're not careful, we will be left behind in Europe because we're going to stop at PSC two and not take another 10, 15 years for PSD3 to come along. Yeah, I was just gonna, I think it's, I think that's a really, um, you know, good uh, illustration of the point that Tobias made earlier around the shift in mindset that's probably happened over the last 10 years where people started out viewing this as, you know, another burden that they had to comply with and now thinking about, well, you know, we're sort of dealing with it. What are the, what's, where's the, what's the potential upside? What more could we be doing to bring benefit to the organization and to, to customers? So I think that's a really positive, positive step. Just one other thing on the standardization bit. I mean, the, the EBA published the guidelines for these APIs in around Christmas time or thereabouts, and they had to be implemented by June. So that didn't give really much time to sit around the table and actually discuss these things because banks just had to start developing there and then. I mean, it was the, the, the time uh, uh, plan has been a bit optimistic, I think. Indeed. Um, some interesting points that have been raised, which we'll come back to. I hope you have all been proactive and used your mobile phone to vote on the question that was uh, put to you. Uh, and hopefully we can bring it up on the screen so we can see some stats, which was what is the single biggest barrier to well-functioning APIs in September 2019? Um, and interestingly, or maybe not surprisingly, we have, uh, as the winner of this poll, the top polling position is a lack of regulatory clarity, but followed actually by a close second with unreliable performance. Um, oh, no, it's changing. Wow, it's really interactive. <laughs> the benefit of being at a RegTech conference. Um, if I can maybe take that bottom one, unreliable performance, because I think that's a really key uh, area, is the ecosystem won't work without well-performing APIs. And I think you know, it's an organization that launched the CMA OBI APIs last, uh, last January. Everything didn't go smoothly for the industry, and it was difficult. It's a new technology. Um, and I think that will show the problems that get posed come September. Um, you know, there won't be probably strong performing APIs across the entirety of Europe straight away, and it will take quite a few months, if not longer, to get everyone up to a good standard. Um, and I think that's going to pose a real problem for the, the TPPs. So, interesting, we will come on to um, lack of regulatory clarity in a minute, because that is the top 
sort of answer, and it'll be useful to get some input on the audience as to what they think is unclear. But just just talking about unreliable performance, because it is a topic that comes up regularly, um, you know, you're all doing this very much on a daily basis. We know the challenges that the regulation places around performance and that it's got to be as good as, but actually, what, what do you think? What, what, how do you think we solve this performance issue? How we solved performance issues? So when, when we launched, we had um, performance issues. We had to go root and branch um, back through our API stack uh, and review every single step. Uh, and it did take months. Um, but we got performance back down again. Now, why that happens is because the, in the live production environment, you can't fully replicate that in your testing environments because you can't fully replicate TPPs. Therefore, you're always going to have to have this almost live proving period. Um, and actually something the UK has done quite well now is every launch, we've had this kind of live proving period where the TPPs and the, the ASPSPs have been working together. Uh, and that's really helped because there's often issues on both sides. Um, oh, you've, you've built it that way. We've not quite built it that way. We've built it slightly differently. If anyone's seen MasterChef and they have to cook the two things with a screen in the middle, they'll see the output of steak and chips. But um, PS2 doesn't have that. PS2 just goes live on a single date. And so I, I think that's going to be a, a real, real issue. Probably not so much for the UK because we've had this extended period, um, potentially for some of the more medium-sized banks in the UK and, and definitely across Europe. Thank you. Do you have any thoughts on performance? On the, on the performance bit? Well, I, I, I think, as I said, I think the banks are really trying hard on this, and, and it's been one of the Commission's main worries that the banks would uh, do uh, badly performing APIs, and then they could sort of keep the TPPs out, and that's not what, basically what, what we're seeing. So I don't think it'll be the performance, it'll rather be the functionality that, that might uh, not live up to the hopes of uh, the users. Just anything to add? No? Then I think, um, given that there is a predominant view in the audience that there is lack of regulatory clarity, uh, but I don't want to put Tobias on the hot seat per se, but maybe yeah, if you have some more questions, we can have some... We've got some roving mics, and uh, yes, we have a, a question here. Uh, thank you, guys. It's very interesting uh, so far. So I find open banking quite interesting because it wasn't, at least my opinion, it wasn't necessarily consumer-driven. I didn't see customers asking for this service, very much a regulator's idea. Do you have any worries that when we switch everything on, people aren't lining up to use this functionality? And, and, and if not, you know, how do you see the propositions evolving to really entice customers to get on board? I can take a stab at that one. So um, I think that's a really, I think that's a really good point. And um, you know, certainly the conversations that I've been a part of over the last, you know, 18 months to two years, I think there's been a shift in mentality, where um, you know, originally, particularly on the incumbent side, they had you know, large scale, scale distribution and this thing called open banking, which they now knew they needed to embrace. And so they started sort of thinking about, well, how can I? you know, put features that make use of open banking on top of my distribution, right? And it's kind of the wrong way around. And there's a big difference between a, a feature and a product, right? Um, so I think that the way that that conversation has evolved is now you have people sort of, particularly within incumbents, designing around the customer um, in, a, in a much more customer-centric way, thinking about how they can fundamentally change or improve the, the proposition. And I think one of the things that will be interesting to see is um, how far that goes, because if you sort of look back over, um, you know, disruptive periods, it's generally not the, the application of the technology that's disruptive, it's what, how the technology has enabled a, a fundamentally different business model, right? So if you think about Uber, Deliveroo, Airbnb, whatever, you know, none of them are ahead because they have way better technology than, than everybody else. They've disrupted their market because they've applied that technology into a business model that is unique, better, and different, right? And so I think for the market to truly take advantage of open banking, it will need to also lead to a change in the, in the application of the technology to the business model, and we're probably like halfway there. Yeah, and maybe the, the customer doesn't need to know that you do open banking. So it's strange you mentioned those companies, APIs drive most of those companies. 
uh, Uber being the prime, prime example, you know, a customer needs to know that when they go through their mortgage application, they can now just upload their banking data straight away. Do they need to know it's open banking or APIs or PS2? No, they, they don't care. It's quicker and they don't have to print out 13 pages of bank statements and, and send it in by post because that's the only way. And that's what will drive forward uh, the use. That's happening, but your fear is correct. It, it won't be a, a big bang to start with. Um, and we were discussing kind of before we walked in, there are still multitudes of people who won't use mobile banking or online banking. So how are you going to get them to use open banking and APIs? Building the confidence in, in probably wider technology will, will help everything. Well, I think to just to quickly come back on, on Andy's point there, I think that's I think that's right. And um, you know, key is aligning incentives are on that customer journey so that people understand when they're being asked for permission to share that data, what it's being used for, and how it will benefit them. So if you know, we're, we're kind of still in the very early innings of this, right? We've got 120 odd regulated. Um, of bodies who, who can use open banking data. You know, we just did the first SME loan using open banking data, I think, in November of last year, right? But because it shrunk the time for that application to under an hour, now you have two-thirds of iWOCUS customers volunteering to provide open banking data. So I think it's just that clear benefit associated with the, the, the consent that will, will drive the adoption. Yeah, well, I, I agree with my, my fellow panelists. I think it's all about the customer proposition, and if you get the products out there that actually work and that the customers need, they will also use it. I think one of the largest Danish banks now offer the opportunity that you can see your bank accounts with other banks when you go into their internet banking, and of course that's very smart, so people will use it. I think one of the problems is perhaps, uh, as, as, uh, as um, Andy also alluded to, that the PSD2 is not perhaps the best written uh, legislation you'll ever meet, so we might have to move on to a PSD3 or PSD4 where minds are a bit more open about what can you actually use open banking for, because it was a very, very fixed on initiating payments to web merchants and uh, budget applications, and, and that's the way it's been written. So we probably need PSD5 maybe before we sort of get... Uh... 2.1. <laughs> Great, thanks guys. Thank you. Um, we have a question here. I'll take this one and then I'll come to you. Hi. Um, so if we think about um, patient zero being the bank's uh, customer client, um, how, do you, how have you thought about ensuring privacy and consent all the way down the chain? And um, attached to that is, if things go wrong, where does liability lie? Oh, that's a tough question. Uh, who'd like to take that one? I'll take a first stab at that one, actually. Uh, and from the way, you'd probably be able to help me out quite a bit as well, actually. So I think the consent and author, kind of authorization is one of the fundamental points of PSC2. Um, and that's been very important when we're building our kind of wireframes and customer journeys, is making sure that the customer knows exactly what they're signing up to and they have to give their express permission uh, to do that. And then the third party can only access that information. Uh, and that's, that's really key in kind of A, building the trust with the customer, um, uh, and B, uh, I think for financial data, we have to have that because otherwise uh, the risk of kind of fraud and, and uh, other nasties kind of increases. So that's underpinned. In terms of liability, there is actually a liability framework um, embedded within the UK as well. So it, it does set out that process quite well and I won't go into it in detail now. Um, interestingly as well, uh, and actually it's something that other countries around the world struggle with. So they, they get the API and the, the maybe the sexier bit, uh, and they struggle with especially the liability side. And it's something that often other countries from outside of Europe haven't thought of yet. Uh, and we do have to kind of help them with that. No, you will have to have this in place, otherwise the market probably won't work. Um, so yeah, anyway, maybe I'll stop there, but yes, it's important, and yes, it is in place. So I think it's, um, I think it's a, a really uh, important question to ask. But I think you know whenever you know you have this type of discussion, it's also important to uh, question the assumption that what we have now is better. And you know there was a similar debate happening when you know you sort of move to the cloud and everybody's going, oh no, what happens? Our data is in the cloud. What happens if somebody gets it, right? But the vast it doesn't mean that on-prem is safer, right? When the majority of breaches happen within an organization. So I think it, you know it, it's it's absolutely the right question to be asking, but you also have to kind of look and think, well, yeah, there's going to be 
some risks around adopting a, a new technology, but you know, is having somebody send in all of their personal information over, it, through the mail, you know, safer than delivering it via API? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, as mentioned, the, the, the customer consent is a key part of the directive, and, uh, and there's also in the directive sort of rules for, for liability. I still think that we will see some battles on if it goes wrong, uh, how, where to place the, the liability, but uh, the rules are there at least. I think that debate on data and liability is part of a whole bigger question around data, who has access to it, who owns it, uh, who can see it? I think that's going to be an ongoing debate uh, over the coming years, uh, you know, and I think it will be looked at not only just on a European level, but at, a, at an EU level, uh, a global level as well. Um, the lady over there. Thank you. Uh, you guys touched on this slightly before, and I think we'll start with Tobias. The Euro um, Retail Payments Board is coming out with a report sometime in June, and they will be touching on whether or not this should be extended to include securities accounts, and mortgage accounts, pension accounts, as you mentioned earlier. First of all, PSD2 is payments, so it wouldn't really fit in there, but is that something that you see happening in the near future to this expansion, this extension into other types of accounts under a different proviso? Well, that's mainly a political question, so I, I, I won't decide on that, but I, I think it's, it's the logical next step, and I think the debate is already there, because the, the debate is now, uh, okay, you, you, you regulate the access to payment accounts, but does that mean that we can, without a, a license, uh, access other data from the, the banking app? And so the, the debate is already there, and then it's probably better to, to regulate rather than to, to have this sort of a quite unclear situation as it is at, as the moment. So I think it will, I think it will come. but. Uh, Knowing uh, legislative pro processes within the EU, uh, don't hold your breath, I think. I think you're absolutely right. The debate is there. I think the other part of that conversation, though, is actually what can be commercialised and what has to be for free. And I think this is something that everybody is going to grapple with going forward because PSD2, payment account data, is provided at no cost to the TPPs. And I think that that is now becoming clear that that's, you know, whether that's balanced or not is another debate that we could have. But if you look at the direction of travel in the UK, you can see the CMA has already said that uh, savings accounts should be thought about. The FCA has said something similar in its business plan and is looking at open finance. We have discussions across regulators uh, about open data, and maybe that's something that you could actually bring into the discussion. Yeah, and I think near-term future may be a little bit optimistic. Um, I, I think in the future, yes, definitely. Um, but I think before you get there, and, and, and you touched on it just now, is I think if, if banks are left to solve, what they'll do is they'll use the technology and partner with TPPs. So rather than having open APIs for the, the non-legislative products, you might see a bit like you've got in, in the US right now is you have partnerships with specific TPPs. So, you know, we will, you can access our, our mortgages, but suddenly it's not an open API. Um, and that will probably maybe fill the gap between P82 and maybe open finance, which brings in all, all the other products. Uh, and maybe just to throw out a spanner in the thought for everyone is why, why stick up financial products? So, uh, it, you know, many people here kind of reg tech firms so if you want someone's data, should they not have control of all their data? So should they not have control of all their data from Google and Amazon? And should that not also be available by open APIs? Maybe it's a, a, a long-term future, but I think the world is heading in that direction. So. I can just say, well, that's similar to the framework that they're looking at in Australia, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, we can share with utilities and telecoms and across and this idea of horizontal data sharing and reciprocity, which at some point makes sense. Correct. And interestingly, it's, it's not the financial regulator in Australia that's driving APIs. It's the, I think it's the data regulator. Um, so it just shows that other countries are moving in that direction, probably maybe slightly quicker than we are. Another question there from the gentleman. Yeah, hi. Um, what do you think about application like token IO or something like this kind of proxy? Do you think that could be they could be beneficial or 
to a wider adoption of the standard or to set the standard, besides to create a lock-in band, the band or lock-in probably? So again, I can probably take that one. So, uh, so people don't know, token IO are a TPP registered, um, and actually I think they're using uh, open banking APIs already. I don't think TPPs on their own would set a, a standard. I know in the OBIE, TPPs have been involved in the setting of the standard. And I think it's useful to have uh, third parties and the, and the banks and maybe then kind of independent third party create those central standards. But I think that's how it has to go rather than any one of the parties setting up a kind of centralized standard. Um, does that answer your question, I think? Yeah. yeah. Do we have any more questions in the room? No, then I think um, I will ask my panellists one final question shortly. Um, so obviously we've got 14th of September, PSD2, open banking, and if you actually think about the discussion we've had, we've had a situation where I think reg tech, fin tech, pay tech, and probably even legal tech have all converged in mm, a perfect storm, maybe you could call it. Um, but what would be your sort of thoughts for the audience of, you know, how you see the future evolving? Um, probably not maybe in the next, you know, 18 months, but further down the track, maybe five to ten years from now. If we could take that from each of you, I'll, I'll start with Justin. So I'll, I'll give a kind of near-term prediction and a longer-term prediction. I think um, on the near-term prediction, I think 2019, particularly the second half of 2019, will be... Um, the beginning of when you see incumbents come to market with more digitally native kind of API first, mobile first propositions. Um, whereas before, you know, it's kind of the fintechs coming out and pushing those. I think the, a lot of the incumbents are going to have really compelling solutions in the market um, in, in the near term, and we'll see more of those. My, my kind of medium to long term prediction is um, I think there's a really interesting convergence taking place between different systems of record. And when I say systems of record, I'm talking, you know, CRM systems, accounting platforms, bank accounts, right? Think places where we go to um, get a view of, you know, our reality, whatever, whatever it might be for our business, for our personal lives. And, um, you know, the, the, the API standards that we're, we're sort of driving, um, you know, within this context of, of open banking, I think, is um, pushing these systems of record into, you know, a higher degree of integration and, and collaboration. So I think um, there'll be some really interesting uh, things that, that come off the back of that collaboration if, if people get it right. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, so I think one thing, we've looked at TPPs and, and banks and regulators, I think we forget that banks and third parties also will work in partnership. So I think actually in the short term, and then short term, I say two, next two years, you'll see a lot more kind of partnerships, both on the deliverance of, say, the propositions, but also you've got psc 2 has got a whole raft of other things. So things like fraud monitoring and fraud reporting. Um, so, you know, reg tech firms, you will almost be needed across Europe to partner with the banks to help them with the kind of the moving forward of, of all of those processes. So that's what you see in the short term. Uh, I think in the long term, you'll actually see this ecosystem kind of really rapidly increasing, and you'll probably see a divergence uh, in offerings to customers. So those that are technically savvy will get more and more and more functionality. I think those that aren't technically savvy uh, are over time going to you know, not suffer, but they just won't gain the benefits of having access to that technology for whatever reason. They don't have good internet signal. They don't like using a mobile phone. You know, the choice is the customer's choice, but they maybe won't benefit as much. I think that's maybe the divergence you'll see for the customer. Thank you. And Tobias? Well, I think I mean, in the short term, I think what we're, we're looking at is a sort of a, a struggle to get there. So I think that the, the benefits of open banking will not be realized for quite a few years, I would think. But if I knew what was coming, I probably wouldn't be working for the public sector. So <laughs> I won't try to be innovative uh, here. I'll leave that to my colleagues. Well, thank you. Um, so, open banking, I think we're all agreed, it is here to stay. It will change the face of financial services. I would like to thank you all for your time and attention this afternoon, and if I could ask you to thank the panellists as well.